One of the pleasures of knowing Otto Scott is the versatility of his background and experience. Besides being a writer of note with a number of exceptionally fine books to his credit, Otto Scott over the years has been in the Merchant Marine. He has been a newspaper man, holding positions from reporter up to editor. And he has been, as well, among many other things, an oil company executive. It's a delight to have Otto on the staff of the Calcedon Foundation. And he shall speak today on the Christian writer, a very important subject because once again, as Christians, we are thinking self-consciously of our responsibility in every sphere of life and thought, and not the least among these is the sphere of writing. So it is a privilege for me to present to you Otto J. Scott. Thank you very much. Talking about writing is like writing about music. It's an effort to describe one medium in the technique of another. And perhaps that's why musicians always feel that critics don't know what they're talking about. And dancers and actors regularly go up the wall when they read what is written about their performance. Nevertheless, words are all we have with which to communicate, so we're stuck with this format. If our comments seem difficult to follow, perhaps you can write and get a transcript of what is said here today about both painting and music, architecture, and the other subjects lumped under the rubric of the media and the art. Last Sunday after the service, I went home and read the New York Times book review. This is not for pleasure. It's a publication that professional writers have to read in order to keep up with what's going on in the industry and what's being done to whom. It's been described as the daily literary fix of millions. One media analyst said more people read the New York Times book reviews than read the books that are reviewed. Therefore, the reviewer's opinion usually outweighs that of the author. But of course, the author's opinions are often discounted anyway, because a great many people believe that they could write just as well if they only had the time. One writer said about that particular belief The writer, in the, their opinion, is needed only for his manual ability to translate other people's experience into words. The non-writer's illusion is, I'm just as good. I have just as much or even more to say. All I miss is a few technical details. These people feel that their experience is unique, as indeed it is. But what they fail to realize is that it's not necessarily relevant. The illusion that anyone can write a book is basic narcissism. Their fantasy transcends reality. And this illusion is peculiar to writing. Nobody believes that without preparation you can sit down and play the piano or become a member of an Olympic ski team. But a great many people seem to think that writing is an automatic ability. It comes uh, without effort. It doesn't. Neither does a knowledge of literature. Writers begin as readers. Dr. Rush Dooney, author of a good many books, has a library of over 30,000 volumes. If you take one of those books from the shelf, open it up, to the end papers, you'll find his comments written in the back, which means that he's read the book and he has written down what he thinks he might someday cite from it. 
Books, in other words, are the tools of a writer's trade. They are not vehicles to journey into fantasy. To write, then, means first to read, then to watch, then to think, and then to figure out how to say what you have come up with in words that will appeal to an audience. To do this, to develop a complex skill, takes time. Charles Dickens began as a reporter, writing in shorthand what the House of Commons was saying in its debates. And his first venture into creative writing, as it's called uh, by non-writers, was to contribute a regular essay to the newspapers of London, Letters from Boz, about what he saw while he walked about the city. But in order to get a good idea of what literature means, we have to go farther back and deeper than Dickens. Eric Auerbach, a German scholar who studied in Germany before World War I, was a professor in philology at the University of Marburg until the Nazis threw him out, lived a long time, and studied literature very deeply. He wrote a book called Mimesis, The Representation of Reality in Western Literature, in which he began by comparing pagan and Christian writing. He began with the Odyssey, and that part where Ulysses returned home and is recognized by his old nurse by a scar on his thigh as she was sponging him. That was a ritual that was conducted in ancient Greece to welcome travelers. She drops the basin from which she had been sponging, a ritual, and was about to cry out when he grabbed her with his right hand and whispered threats and endearments. And at the point where the nurse first saw the scar, there is a digression, very leisurely, in which the reader is carried back to when Ulysses was a boy, to when he visited his grandfather, when the hunt began, when they tracked the wild boar, when there was a struggle, when the scar was received, then the banquet afterwards and so on. This is all told before the nurse drops his foot back into the basin. Now, why, why did Homer do that? We all know that Ulysses had just come home after 20 years to find the palace filled with men who wanted to marry his wife and inherit his kingdom. We can hardly wait to see what he's going to do to these people, how he's going to handle that situation. So in order to build the suspense and to extend it as long as possible, the poet took us on this long digression of the hunt, the grandfather, the boar, the scar, the banquet, and so forth. This was a technique, in other words. But when we finish the Odyssey, what have we got? A wonderful adventure story redolent with action, interesting scenes, a wild variety of men and women, monsters, events, crimes. Men are murdered, turned into swine. Their lives are put at stake by sirens, storms. Writers have been imitating Homer ever since the Odyssey was first sung. But in the end, we're left with a sort of a impression that I used to receive at the end of a good day when I was 12 years old. That was a fine time. We can turn to other pagan writers and we discover the dignity and the stateliness of the pagan world. We find Plutarch, for instance, a biographer of the successful men of Rome and Greece. I remember Plutarch's description of Mark Antony. He led his men over the Alps in the middle of the winter. They had very little wood and very few fires, and the fires were small and the men were freezing. Antony was aware of their discomfort, so he stripped his clothes off and he walked naked from one fire to the next, 
from one group of soldiers to the next, from one sentry to the next. And at each place he said, are you cold? And they said, no. <laughs> now Tacitus, another Roman historian, had a wonderful, uh, elegant style. He, in the first volume of the Annals of Rome, he described a rebellion by several legions. The soldiers argued that they didn't get good food, they had no pension, they, they suffered beatings, all sorts of things. He repeated these complaints in his elegant style, but he called them impudence, disorders against the state. He was not sympathetic. He didn't tell us whether or not their conditions were really bad or good. He didn't tell us anything about conditions. He looked at those men as from a great height because he was writing for the elite. And so, of course, did Homer. The way pagans wrote and sung was for the top. And to this day, there's a certain snobbery attached to the pagan world, to the study of the pagan world. In a speech at Hillsdale College a number of years ago, I th delivered a throwaway line about the Greeks. I said there were elegant barbarians, men from nowhere. And I received an unsolicited four-page, single-spaced, typewritten letter from a hair professor doctor in Switzerland telling me what an ignoramus I am. <laughs> now, Auerbach contrasted Tacitus and the New Testament, not because the New Testament is different from the Old, but because it was written in roughly the same historical period as that in which Tacitus wrote. And he chose the description of Peter's denial of Jesus in the Gospel according to Mark. You'll remember that Jesus was the only one arrested. The rest were left behind. Peter followed the soldiers into the courtyard of the high priest and was brave enough to join the crowd, the servants around the fire. A servant girl spotted him and spoke to him. He answered and his Galilean accent was recognized. He denied who he was and walked away, but she followed and repeated her accusations. Finally, after the third denial, he was allowed to leave. Because, remember, it was a period when a person's honor was identified with his word. To tell a public lie was to condemn oneself to universal contempt, especially when such a lie was allied to one's honor to one's religion, and to one's leader. Now, in this instance, we see the great difference between the pagan writers and the Bible. First of all, we cannot evade the Jewish nature of the Bible. For only the Jews produced a holy book which mingles the mundane details of life with the awesome presence and power of Almighty God. In the New Testament, Auerbach said about Peter, quote, the image of man in the highest and deepest and most tragic sense, rooted in the character of Jewish Christian literature, graphically and harshly dramatized through God's incarnation in a human being of the humblest social station through his existence on earth amid everyday people and conditions, and through his passion, which, judged by everyday standards, was ignominious. And it naturally came to have, in the view of later ages, a wide diffusion and strong effect, and a most decisive bearing upon man's conception of the tragic and the sublime. Here we have Peter, fisherman from the humblest background. The other participants in the courtyard of the high priest's palace were servant girls and soldiers who call upon Peter to play a tremendous role. 
But on the surface, there's very little to this incident except a provincial stir, noted only by those immediately involved. But it was not a small moment in the life of Peter. He had left his home and his occupation and followed his master. He was the first to see him as the Messiah. When disaster struck, he alone resisted. After Jesus was led away by the soldiers, he alone followed. By then, he was shaken by events, and in his discouragement, he fell. His faith was insufficient, and he trembled for his life. But when he left, he heard the cock crow. Then the words of Jesus returned to him. And with the fulfillment of that prophecy, his faith returned. He realized that God had known what would happen. And it was through that experience that the significance of Jesus was revealed to him and through him to countless others through the ages. The distance between Peter as a hero and the heroes of Plutarch and Tacitus and the other pagan writers is immense. The Bible deals with events among the common people, with a new religion that emerged from the depths. What we witness at Auerbach is the birth of a new heart and a new spirit. The entire world changed. All the occurrences in the Bible are concerned with the same question, the same conflict with which every human being is basically confronted in which therefore remains infinite and eternally pending. We too are human and subject to fate and passion, and the Acts of the Apostles show the beginnings of this development which later moved to the forefront of history and still remains the personal concern of all. No pagan writer ever wrote or thought in that way. With Christianity, a new literature arose. After Jesus, the world was different. For 1,800 years, the Bible inspired the literature of a great civilization. The challenge of God who placed us all into life and who tests us all according to our individual measure remained the central theme of the West. This wavered during the Renaissance, which looked to the pagans for inspiration. But at the end of the 16th century and into the 17th, Shakespeare still wrote in the traditional way. His clergymen were from the old church, his, even though his plays were shown to Protestant England. The cast of his plays included people from all walks of life, in every station, in all sorts of settings and scenes. The common people were as present in Shakespeare as in the Bible. And he left his audiences in no doubt that Macbeth and his wife were damned after they succumbed to the temptations of power. In the main, literature in the West remained Christian until the 19th century. There were some losses during the Renaissance, but these were recovered in the Reformation. A slippage appeal appeared during the so-called Age of Reason when an increasing number of novels uh, in the Homeric tradition, adventure, romance, that sort of thing, appeared. But most of these were still suffused with Christian assumptions until Voltaire and Rousseau. Voltaire launched a campaign against Christianity that is still virulent. That's not to say that anybody today can read him. His style is too old-fashioned for that. But Dr. Peter Gay described the Enlightenment as the rebirth of modern paganism, and that's as good a description as any. R Voltaire's wealth, his celebrated circle, his example of stunning success made him a formidable enemy for Christians. But the odd thing is his wealth was not based on his writing. What happened was that the French government set up a lottery that had an unsound basis. Voltaire detected it. He had a mathematical flair. He formed a syndicate, bought all the tickets, 
and became independently wealthy for life. His position, therefore, was deceptive. And though his fame made him seem very tall, he was really very short. He was about five foot three. And he was a small man in other respects as well. It was notoriety that made him so formidable. He was the first of a long line, with which we are now very familiar, of recipients of loud applause. Rousseau, Voltaire's literary rival, similar. His autobiography admits that he placed his bastard infants by his maid at the door of the Catholic nunnery. The church he despised was to take care of his offspring. And his idea of an ideal world was one in which we reverted to nakedness and lived without law and without rules. The ideas of Voltaire and Rousseau are still with us in our literature. Only recently the anthropologist Margaret Mead echoed Rousseau's admiration of the savage and we have lots of mini Voltaires around for whom all evil in the world is concentrated in Christianity. To assume that they're figures from the distant past and therefore unimportant would be an error. Nothing is past that still stirs in our midst and still influences our lives. After Voltaire, the German scholars went to work analyzing the Bible. They separated it. They put the miraculous to one side, and the other, they said, the historical. Now, we can understand that sort of an exercise if we separate Peter from the prophecy of Jesus in the palace courtyard of the high priest. How can that be done? Logically, not very well. To drop the prophecy would be to eliminate the reason for Peter's change of heart from the coward in the courtyard to the hero who propagated the faith. The German method, in other words, made a life of faith appear meaningless. And their influence spread across the globe. It reached into the United States and touched Emerson in Concord, a little town outside of Boston, and he dropped out of the clergy. He couldn't withstand the prestige of the highly placed people in the world of letters, so he went along. And he was not unique. England was hit hard by the new German scholarship. The journals of the time are heavy with religious doubts, questions, despairs. An entire generation fell from faith into apostasy between the 1830s and the 1860s. And the 60s began with Mr. Darwin, who was treated as somebody who proved that God didn't exist. That's still how Darwin is regarded today. And that acceptance, that idea, was promoted by the press, which began to appear in the average home in the period from 1855 to 1890. Now, the press then claimed to be the voice of the people, as it does today. Of course, that's impossible. What the press consisted of, then and now, was of carefully selected writing by carefully selected people who described the world as it looks to liberal eyes, unconnected with churches, with religion, or with Christianity. It's no accident that Marx, Engels, and the Socialist International was so crowded with journalists. It's no accident that they wrote books on socialism, which their friends and associates favorably reviewed in newspapers and magazines. And any resemblance to the New York Times of today is not accidental. What arose in the late 19th century was a campaign against Christianity of international scope and significance. It called itself various names, science, reason, atheism, rationality, free thinking, socialism, liberalism, intellectualism, scholarship, classicism, 
pragmatism, humanism. In Russia, the novelist Ivan Turgenev took notice of a group of young men who believed in nothing, and from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing, coined the word nihilist, somebody who believes in nothing. Dostoevsky wrote about the nihilist so well that some people thought he was inventing new personalities, but he wasn't. A new set of ideas had appeared to challenge Christianity, and people had arisen who believed in the destruction of the Christian state and the Christian religion. And their influence spread all through literature. The bromide that Christianity was an evil drug, an opiate, as Marx called it, appeared in common vernacular among the intellectuals during the opium wars of 1839 to 1842. It went into book after book, and from books it went into mind after mind. Feuerbach a German scholar flirted with that idea. So did Moses Hess, an associate of Marx, and so, of course, did Marx. Owen Chadwick says that's perfectly natural. When Marx said, quote, religion is like the sigh of an oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of a soulless environment, end quote, says Chadwick. This is, after all, a Jew speaking. Jewish people emerging into the light after centuries of injustice were naturally among the radical leaders of Europe. We keep finding them for intelligible reasons from their past, throwing up revolutionary leaders, being a people gifted with their traditional love of books and their innate inclinations to philosophical thinking. The influence of newly emancipated Judaism is not to be ruled out of court in contemplating the rise of the secular state. And he continued, since religious division once kept their people under, they were disposed to challenge all of a European religious tradition. But in the inheritance of Judaism, their own tradition ran deep. They might abandon the religion of their fathers, and with it all religion, but seldom did they thereby come to despise what was once constituent of their people. In other words, they were disinclined to scoff at Judaism, to pour contempt over it, or to launch a campaign against it. What in fact happened is that when religion was attacked Therefore, it was Christianity that was meant. And that situation was assisted by the rise of socialism and its influence among the intellectuals. In the course of that rise, religion became a code word for Christianity and was associated with differences between people. That argument led Marx by stages into the idea that religion is a moral evil. Looking behind that argument, Chadwick noted that it was not too difficult to see Marx's resentment against the Christian state of Prussia, where he once had hopes of an academic career, until the government there ruled that atheists could not hold such a position. Atheism led Marx into exile in Berlin, in Paris, in Brussels, and in London. The Christian establishment rejected him, so he in turn rejected the Christian establishment. And there were a great many, like Marx, in the Socialist International, but they had lots of company. They were joined in their assaults against Christianity by men of science, such as the Darwinians, and their theory that God didn't exist, and the fact that that proposition is unprovable did not deter them. In the Victorian period, the scientists believed that there was a conflict between their discoveries and the Bible. 
Only recently are they getting bewildered about this because their discoveries are leading them into an increasing number of mysteries and an increasing realization of the limitations of human beings. Meanwhile, the assault on Christianity provoked more anger than it did conviction. So it's the argument switched into the argument that religion is a purely private matter of no concern to the government or to society. And by then, a considerable number of ministers and a few priests had joined the socialists in their concern for the poor, for injustice, and for the betterment of mankind. So a combination of arguments came together which led to the nostrums with which we are now familiar and served to shift biblical studies to social action. The very instruments of Christianity were used against it. Bookstores bulged with biographies of socialist martyrs and their successes even after death. They began to talk about the inevitable victory of socialism while decrying the idea of predestination. By the turn of the century, the new alternatives to Christianity had overcome the universities and the intellectuals. The clergy vanished from the administration of colleges their churches had founded and were replaced by educators of carefully neutral opinion. And no government any longer gave preference to Christians, though Christians had built the West and Christians comprised the majority of Western citizens. By the year 1900, the American scholars began to expurgate Christianity from our literature and our textbooks. This was a remarkable step. The history of the Jewish people is one of the more spectacular known to us today. At the time of this taping, Jews in civilization is being shown on television. It took three years to make. And it's important to note that the Jewish people raised their children to know Jewish history from a Jewish viewpoint. And by so doing, they imbue their successive generations with a sense of identity that retains in them a visible and audible pride in their heritage. But the Christian scholars of the United States decided that the heirs of Christendom in this country need not know the history of Christianity. 1,900 years of effort were culled from our history books and only that which tends to place Christianity in a ridiculous or an intolerant light has been retained. The saints did not exist and did no good. The pagans were not converted. Cities grew on their own. Cathedrals were beneath notice. Music, literature, painting, the treasures of the Christian past, became objects of negligible value. Protestants learned only about their individual denominations, if that. Catholics learned only about their church, if that. Now, if the Jewish people had been deprived of the knowledge of their history for three generations, as we have been, generation being 30 years, they would very soon lose that proud identity that distinguishes them today and become as confused and rootless as are the children of so many Christian families. The roots of a people are to be found in its history, but history alone does not speak. It lies in the cemeteries of the human race, in ruined buildings, in forgotten figures, in vanished generations. It is revived and brought to life by the hard-won skills of writers and scholars. When those words stop being written and heard, history comes to an end. Our history stopped. 
and we and our children are paying the price. We were told you don't have to be religious to be a good person. By that they meant you don't have to be Christian to be good. Moral principles, we were told, can exist without a religion, even when they are the moral principles of a religion. But when men ceased to defend Christianity, Europe fell into pessimism and drifted into fratricidal war. Hermann Rauschnig, who broke with Hitler, remembered Germany before World War I. Very few Germans, he said, believed in Christianity by that time, excepting the very elderly, and there weren't any of them on the general staff. Recalling the activities of the German scholars who shredded biz biblical belief in German intellectual circles, that's no surprise. It's also no surprise that a few more domestic problems uh, occurred. The Germans turned to Hitler. After all, people who lose sight of God have no one else to follow but the devil. Between the wars, during my school years, literature appeared that debunked our heroes, criticized a system that keeps us alive, and knocked the tradition of the West. Not of anywhere else, mind you. Not of any other religion. Only ours. And unlike Europe between 1890 and 1914, we didn't have any voices of defense. No American Dostoevsky appeared in our literature. No Turgenev, no Tolstoy. Not that they stopped the avalanche. But we look into them today to find out where we are, for there are parallels. Solzhenitsyn put us today in Russia, 1905. In 1909, a small group of Russian writers, all of whom grew up under socialism and Marxism in the last decades of the 19th century, and all of whom had revolted against those ideas, wrote a series of articles in a book called Landmarks. Those articles criticized the view that prevailed in Russian intellectual circles and called for, quote, a return to traditional religious values, which for most of them meant Christianity, as a necessary condition for the regeneration of the country's intellectual, cultural, and social life, end quote. That book caused a great stir inside Russia, Lenin denounced it, and the authors, still alive in 1918, wrote and issued a second book called De Profundis. In this, they described the October Revolution as the inevitable consequence of the intelligentsia's thirst for power. As one of them put it, Russia had now been seized by evil spirits like those in Gogol's nightmarish tales, or by the possessed of Dostoevsky's prophetic imagination. It was not simply a change of regime, but a profound spiritual disaster, a self-willed descent into the abyss. The Bolsheviks confiscated that immediately. Only two copies survived in the West, and they where it was virtually unknown and unobtainable until it was reprinted in Paris in 1967. So there were warnings of what would happen and analyses of what did happen. De Profundis was finally reprinted by Soviet exiles. And similar warnings of what is in store for the West were issued in a book subsidized by Solzhenitsyn, called From Under the Rubble. Some of the contributors have since vanished into Siberia and have not been heard of since. Everybody knows now that Solzhenitsyn is a Christian writer, but the world didn't know he was a Christian until after he was exiled from the Soviet Union. Before then, they knew him as the author of 
the man who wrote A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. This description of a day in a slave labor camp in the time of Stalin does not even mention God or Christianity. It was sent to the country's leading literary magazine and the editor showed it to Khrushchev. Now, as Christians, we believe that God softened the heart of the ruler of the Soviet people so that he allowed the work of Solzhenitsyn to appear before the world. Because, of course, that's what happened. But the secular rationale is that Khrushchev wanted to destroy the Stalinist legend and Solzhenitsyn's work helped by breaking the silence about slave labor camps. That silence was held up until then throughout all official Russia and, strangely enough, all official West. The official West has still never recognized the fact that there are slave camps in Russia. The second book that Solzhenitsyn wrote, called The First Circle, he took the title from Dante, in Dante's first circle of hell are the enlightened pagans. And the first circle for Solzhenitsyn was a special institution where during World War II, technicians were taken out of slave labor camps and given special privileges, decent food, and so on, in order to help the Soviet war effort. In this book, Solzhenitsyn takes a number of characters, a dedicated Jewish Marxist, Stalin himself, a humanist, and somebody who wavers between these various viewpoints. At no time do we know what the author himself thinks. But we receive a vision of a world saturated with suspicion and fear. There is one scene, I remember, where the prisoners were told to clean their cells, and they were given religious pictures to hang on the walls. And Bibles and Talmuds because there were three American visitors coming through. One was Mrs. R, which makes you think of that wonderful political chucklehead, Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> and the other were two Quaker ladies. And they were, of course, to see the prisoners uh, enjoying all the comforts and solace of their religion. Finally, however, Solzhenitsyn published outside of the Soviet Union the first volume of the Gulag Archipelago, which consists of a series of experiences reported to him by the people who underwent them in the slave camps. And because of the Gulag books, we know how Solzhenitsyn converted. His conversion arrived, as everyone's conversion arrived, when God called him. Nothing in his life prior to that event gives you any suspicion that that would ever happen because Solzhenitsyn believed in Soviet communism all his life. He took a copy of Das Kapital with him when he went on his honeymoon so he could study. He graduated from college, and in order to graduate from college in the USSR, as here, you have to be a good communist, or at least here, maybe a good Marxist. <laughs> he became a school teacher, and a school teacher in any country in a government school is a government official who teaches the party line. In World War II, he became an officer. He was proud of his shoulder boards and his status. His crime, for which he was sent to Siberia, was that he wrote some jokes about Stalin in a private letter. Jokes. In the prison camp, he didn't want to be mistaken for being an ordinary sort, so he wore his officer's coat from which the epaulets had been ripped until it was in tatters. Before he was arrested, he had toyed with the idea of joining the secret police after the war. If I had, he wrote, I would have ended up in the cellar of the Lubyanka prison, just like the rest, as a torturer. Instead, it was my good fortune to be sent to Siberia, where I met God. That fits a familiar pattern. Eldridge Cleaver, 
serving a prison sentence for rape, wrote a book called Soul on Ice that made him famous. It's hard to believe that a man could write a book about rape as an act of racial revenge and have it become a bestseller amongst the people against whom it was directed. But that's what happened here. Later, after a shootout with police, by then a leader of the racist Black Panthers, Cleaver fled the country. He traveled into Algeria and a few other places, and he met some real devils. Finally, he was in France. He had an apartment in Paris, very hard to get, by the way, and he had a house on the Riviera, and he was miserable. God called him. After that, he came back to the United States to face the music. The Society of Separationists, an atheist organization, gave him their Religious Hypocrite of the Year Award in 1977. Some Christians turned their backs. The media, which had hailed him as a revolutionary hero, cast him into outer darkness. The same sort of thing happened to Solzhenitsyn. From being held aloft as one of the great figures of the world while he was in the Soviet Union, when he came out and it was discovered that he was a Christian, the revulsion was almost visible. When he spoke at Harvard with the same honesty that he spoke in the Soviet Union, he was booed. Editorials appeared charging him with prejudice. That's a very familiar charge. I don't, I'm not making any personal comparison when I say that I told some acquaintances in San Diego before I moved to the mountains to be near Dr. Rush Dooney and Cal Seton that I am a Christian. And my host, who until then had been a model of courtesy, said, What? I thought you were a free thinker. Now you tell me you're a bigot. <laughs> the campaign against Christianity has made a lot of progress. What it means to a writer is that his chances of being published decline as soon as his faith is known. I told the president of the New York Times Book Company that I'd formed a connection with Cal Seaton. I described Dr. Rush Dooney and his work, and Tom Lipscomb said, I thought you were an intelligent man. Now you tell me you're connected to some smarmy cult. You can imagine if a world figure of the stature of Solzhenitsyn encounters difficulty over his faith what ordinary Christian writers encounter. Anti-Christians today enjoy a situation they have not had since the time of the Caesars, when the persecution of Christianity lasted three centuries. In the USSR, after the Bolsheviks achieved control of the government, they murdered over 300,000 priests and nuns. A similar, more recent purge was conducted in Red China. Persecution of Christianity continues today in many parts of the world, including in our next-door neighbor, Mexico. Many Americans are blissfully unaware of that, and many more are indifferent. There is an anti-Christian tilt to contemporary literature. That's no secret. Plays like Mary, Sister Ignatius explains it all to you. And others are on the boards now that are clearly anti-Christian. We have books like The Passover Plot on airplane racks and library shelves and in the neighborhood supermarket. All this is common knowledge. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But you may not know the extent of the campaign and the depth of its penetration and its significance because it has continued, despite the protests, to gather strength over a century. And it's now a very formidable force that has cast half the world into darkness and silence. 
To sit quietly at such a time, therefore, is to assist in your own intellectual murder. <clears throat> it's to deny your faith. And the Christian writer must be assisted to redress this situation. And in this condition, we should take a leaf from the people from whom we inherited our religion, from the Jewish people. When they were huddled in the Warsaw Ghetto, they organized a committee to make a record of everything that happened during the day. Because they learned a long time ago that a people should know what is being done to them. Through the centuries, they've learned to recognize their enemies. And although their enemies cite many different reasons for their disagreements, there is only one thing all the enemies agree on, and that is that they cover all the Jews. They don't say, that criticism was only aimed at Hasidic Jews. Well, I'm a Reformed Jew. They know better than that. And so firmly have they learned it. And so firmly do they insist upon the connection between Judaism and God that everyone else is aware of that nexus. I told a friend of mine once that I made a certain decision because of God. And he looked at me. And he said, I never heard of anybody getting a message from God except a Jew. But you can attack Christians. You can attack Christianity. You can satirize Jesus. You can smear ministers. And I can only say that as Christians, for us to allow this to develop, is very foolish. Christians in the arts, whether in literature or music, painting, dancing, or any other vehicle, are part of your protection against the enemies of Christianity. We're foot soldiers, so to speak, in an intellectual war. And we need to have help to carry the message. Until we succeed with it, there will be no Christian reconstruction if we succeed, the world will be renewed. Don't forget, Peter recovered in that courtyard. He went out a different person. And as we move into the third generation, the third age, it's our vocation, I believe, to help one another, to assist each other, to move forward, to push back the tide that's almost swallowed us. There are nobody else to do it. We were the ones selected for the task. Thank you very much.